we're now seeing your screen and we can hear you Perfect. well. Perfect. Well, I wanted to thank you for inviting us to our webinar series, and I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I wanted to begin by reading a quote that's in our 2020 report to Congress from Jessica McCauley, the former South Atlantic Council Chair. The cooperation and collaboration with NOAA's Deep Sea Coral Research Technology Program and the Office of Ocean Exploration over the past few years to map, explore, and discover new complex deep water ecosystems in the South Atlantic region continues to validate and reinforce the Council's conservation of the most extensive deep water ecosystem in the world. Who needs to go to Mars when every new dive into the abyss illuminates the world of wonder and discovery in the systems that in some cases have been building over thousands of years? It's one of my favorite quotes that I've, well, that's been applied to our program, but there's not that many you can say that about. It's just one of my favorite quotes in general. And we've been really pleased to get such positive feedback from the Council and appreciate the opportunity to share recent deep sea coral and sponge related research in the region. So the things I'd like to highlight for you today include a little bit of background on deep sea corals and on NOAA's program designed to support and share research on these valuable and vulnerable ecosystems. <clears throat> then I'd like to focus on a few of the key findings from our recently completed four year research initiative in that region especially the amazing deep sea coral reef habitat to the Blake Plateau, surveys in the Carolina Canyons that could be of interest to the Council for future protections in an area with limited fishing, and shallower shelf edge coral habitats, many of which are already protected by snapper grouper MPAs. But before I do that, I need to note the extent to which the South Atlantic Council has acted as an early leader in deep sea coral protection. The oldest section of the Octolina Bank habitat area of particular concern designated in the 80s was probably the first deep sea coral protection in the world. That and subsequent protections show the strong prescience of this council to act swiftly to protect important habitat. So corals receive most of um, what little attention deep sea habitats get. But sponges are also an important part of these understudied ecosystems. So we are the Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program, but sponges create important habitat as well, and we study both of these organisms. Um, here you can see lots of different shapes and sizes of deep sea corals, with three particularly unique examples of sponges here down the right side of the slide. Since these animals are not dependent on warm water or sunlight, they're distributed throughout much of the world's deep oceans. But despite their prevalence, there's still a lot to learn about them and their habitat since the deep sea is probably the least explored and known environment on Earth. Deep sea corals live below the reach of sunlight and um, known species actually outnumber shallow coral species with new ones discovered every year. It's a really exciting place to be is that. With different feeding habitats and shallow coral and their cold water environment, deep sea corals are incredibly so slow growing, an order of magnitude slower than shallow corals. The world's largest known coral is this almost 19 foot long Gorgonian. The researcher who found it said it was so big that they drove the submarine right under it. The minivan sponge right here uh, was estimated to be larger than the ROV that found it, which you'll see an image of in a minute. And the oldest known marine creature in the world is believed to be a 4,265 estimated year old deep water black coral that was discovered in Hawaiian waters. The deepest coral found in our database is this type of octocoral from the Caribbean. Just a little bit of background on how interesting these animals are um, for a little bit more and why they're important. Um, I have a number of features on this slide. Uh, this is deep sea coral reefs are productive habitats that provide spawning grounds for commercially desirable fish, such as groupers, snappers, sea bass, rockfish, shrimp, lobster, crabs, could go on and on. Coral skeletons also incorporate trace elements from the surrounding water as they're formed, reflecting the physical and chemical conditions present at that time. <clears throat> and sponges can filter water and increase the oxygen content. Some have even shown to have cancer-fighting properties. What's important to remember about these ecosystems <clears throat> is how fragile and vulnerable they are to fishing and other human activities. <clears throat> Deep sea research can involve a number of tools, such as mapping, 
truck cams, tow cams, autonomous underwater vehicles, remotely operated vehicles like the Deep Discoverer here, operated by NOAA Ocean Exploration, and human operated vehicles, uh, sorry, human occupied vehicles. Uh, our program supports research with any or all of these tools as needed, and you'll see evidence of that in a little bit. Um, so about our program, uh, NOAA's Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program came from the 2007 reauthorization of the Magnuson-Stevens Act. It's the only U.S. government program specifically designed to study these ecosystems. It supports mapping, surveys, research, analysis, modeling, really anything that gets us closer to understanding deep sea coral habitats. The program integrates expertise across and beyond NOAA, and we're focused on providing information to managers. Since the program falls under Magus and Stevens Act, we're particularly focused on providing information to fishery management councils. As such, our research projects are developed in consultation with councils to help address the impacts of fishing and inform management decisions that can affect these vulnerable deep sea habitats. Um, our mission, put simply, is providing sound science to research man resource managers. And in this pursuit, we've developed feedback loops so that scientists, data providers, managers, and stakeholders can all help inform our program and ensure constant improvement. A major component of our program is a series of field research initiatives focused on improving our knowledge of deep sea coral ecosystems in a particular region. These initiatives last for four years and they rotate through different regions of the US. The research that comprises these initiatives, as well as smaller targeted projects such as predictive habitat modeling, is prioritized in collaboration with a number of partners, of course, including councils. And research results are brought together by a centralized and publicly available accessible, available and accessible database shown here. Collaboration is central to the way we run these programs. In each region, we kick off initiatives by bringing together researchers and managers who identify the science and management priorities that shape an initiative's research plan. In this case, I'm showing an image of uh, the initial um, initiative priorities workshop in St. Pete and the science plan that came out of that to guide uh, the Southeast initiative that took place from 2016 to 19, which I'll talk about in a minute. This collaborative approach continues through data collection and analyses to ensure research is responsive to and ultimately informs management decisions by providing usable information to managers like councils, sanctuaries, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and other entities. So like I said, the centerpiece of our program has been the regional field research initiatives. We've now funded at least one initiative in each region of the country. Our very first initiative began right here in the South Atlantic in 2009, when this council was finalizing its ecosystem plan. But today we'll focus on the second initiative from 2016 to 19 which encompassed all three Southeast Council regions. First, I'd like to reiterate that none of this work would be possible without our partners, which allows us to pursue multiple priorities and leverage resources and expertise. In the Southeast, a number of NOAA offices, other agencies, universities, and of course the councils contributed their time, their energy, and their resources to make the initiative work. We would especially like to acknowledge the regional initiative lead, Peter Etmeyer, from the NOAA National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Peter led many projects and involved people with a long history of research in the South Atlantic, including John Reed, Sandra Brooke, Chuck Messing, and others. And he also involved a number of students and I think had more student projects in this initiative than we've had in the past, which is also, also exciting. This was the most ambitious initiative probably that we've had so far, since it did include the three council regions. It included 21 expeditions, 250 days at sea, over 160,000 square kilometers mapped, which is almost the size of the state of Florida. And these activities included surveys of the most extensive known deep sea coral reefs in, the, coral reefs in US waters. And uh, which doesn't happen all the time, both South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico council staff were on some of those ex expeditions, one of whom just introduced me today. Uh, we also conducted data rescue in all three regions 
analyzing images and video back to 1998. As a result, in the South Atlantic region alone, we more than tripled the available data on known locations of deep sea corals and sponges. Researchers also discovered new species, created the first regional deep sea coral related geo database, and created new image identification guides. They were really, really busy. <laughs> they created a lot of things that will endure long past the four year initiative window. So our partners participated in nine expeditions as part of the initiative, specifically in the South Atlantic region, and they conducted nearly 100 dives to the seafloor. The majority of this work focused on the Blake Plateau, circled here in yellow, which Sam will also talk about. And the results of the initiative are described in our final report, which I will link in the chat at the end of the presentation. Our focus on the Blake Plateau reflects the known importance of deep sea Lophelia coral mountains or reefs, which can be found in deep seas from Norway to Argentina. But the concentration and extent of reefs discovered and documented during this initiative in the South Atlantic region are really globally exceptional. In addition to the corals themselves, these reefs support many other species and are often hotspots for biological diversity. Subsequent Subsequent research on the Blake Plateau has only highlighted how valuable past protections in this area have been and how much more ecologically important those areas are than many of us knew before mapping and surveys took place. Because of their size, Lophelia Mounds are one of the few deep sea habitats that can be identified in some cases through multi-beam sonar mapping. And Sam will also talk about this in a few minutes. The size and the number of mounds discovered and characterized during this initiative is impressive. But beyond the Lophelia corals themselves, these reefs house a tremendous amount of biodiversity. These new findings underscore the foresight that the South Atlantic Council had <clears throat> to already have protected what we now think is the largest deep sea coral reef province discovered to date, which is really impressive. Most of the newly discovered reefs occur within existing habitat area of particular concern boundaries but some rich mound areas extend beyond those current protections. Another initiative focus was on a system of submarine canyons off North Carolina, including the first surveys of a few of these canyons. While the diversity of corals found here was lower than in Lophelia reefs, these canyons support a very different suite of species. And they also tend to support higher diversities of corals and sponges than other areas of the continental slope. Such canyon systems extend from the Carolinas north all the way and beyond the Canadian border. And they've recently been the focus of habitat protection by the Mid-Atlantic and New England councils, which closed the deeper extent of their canyons, as you can see here in the gray, the large gray and purple areas, <coughs> to practically all seafloor contact fishing through the Magnus and Stevens Act Deep Sea Coral Discretionary Authority. Given their habitat value, the South Atlantic Council may wish to consider whether similar protections might be warranted for the southern end of these canyon systems too. Uh, finally, I'd like to touch on shallower shelf edge coral gardens with aggregations of gorgonians, black corals, and sponges. These habitats have been the focus of the Council's existing snapper grouper MPAs which have been surveyed by the NOAA Southeast Fishery Science Center and by Harbor Branch. Our initiative supported rescue and analyses of older video, as well as more recent surveys in 2016 and 18. A major result of these later surveys was finding large fields of, fields of Swiftia corals with many associated fishies. Swiftia is known to support lots of other species, and importantly, it provides shelter and habitat for small forage fish, particularly those of snappers and groupers. The pink dots on the left show dives conducted in 2018 that I just talked about inside and outside of the yellow shaded deepwater MPAs, which discovered new coral gardens, including the richest yet seen outside the current boundaries of Edisto MPA. The council may want to consider whether these new findings merit additional recommendations to protect essential fish habitat in these areas. All of this information, data records, including images, habitat modeling, and much more 
are available through the Deep Sea Corals Research Technology Program's data portal and map shown here, as well as uh, the final initiative report that I showed earlier and we'll link at the end. There are tons and tons of graphs, maps, uh, all kinds of information available there for the council to consider. Um, and just coming back to this website for a second, we're currently upgrading our map and data portal to add significant new tools to better understand the distribution of deep sea coral and sponge habitats. So we'll be back uh, in touch with Chip and Roger in uh, hopefully just a few months to share our new portal. So since the end of our Southeast initiative in 2019, uh, NOAA Ocean Exploration has conducted several additional mapping and ROV expeditions to the Blake Plateau, which you'll hear more about soon. And a few months ago, the National Ocean Mapping, Exploration, and Characterization Council, known as NOMAC, uh, published a report detailing the strategic priorities for ocean exploration and characterization within the U.S. Exclusive Economic Zone, which identified the Blake Plateau as a top priority for future exploration and characterization of benthic habitats and cultural heritage. There are only five areas chosen around the entire country, around the entire EEZ, including Alaska and the Pacific Islands. And the Blake Plateau was I think, the second in the list of prioritized areas, but it was absolutely one of the top five. The Deep Sea Coral Research Technology Program working with its partners, can provide the Council with further targeted analyses on any of the new coral and sponge information that I've talked about today. And we're also starting to incorporate fish, uh, data on fish, from many of these areas into our National Deep Sea Coral and Sponge Database, providing additional information to help inform decisions on essential fish habitat. So also as part of the recent Southeast Deep Sea Coral Initiative, a team from the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science and COS worked with BOM to create habitat suitability models. Their report was recently released detailing outputs from occupancy modeling that used advanced presence absence data, allowing us to produce maps of actual coral occurrence probability, moving beyond measures of relative habitat suitability. And I will also link that if uh, people are interested at the end of the presentation. Another advance with these new models is that results are based on more specific taxonomic groups than they have been in the past. And there's also a map of predictive, predicted richness that relies on 24 genera. The primary author, Matt Pody, is ready to present to the council's SSC. Um, and that's in, a, in addition to the BOM report that he's helped produce, he's also uh, about to submit a journal manuscript, um, both of which will be available to the SSC. Initiative researchers also participated in a multi-year deep search study with Temple University, Ocean Exploration, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, and the USGS, which led to some exciting discoveries too. The one with the most media attention was mapping and characterizing the Richardson Reef Complex on the Blake Plateau, a discovery of the longest uh, likely continuous known deep sea coral reef in the country at 85 linear miles. The deep search report is expected to be available in the next few months. So I can't share that yet, but, uh, but when it's out, I'd be happy to get in touch with Chip and Roger and share that report too. Finally, a major multi-million dollar effort is underway to restore mesophotic and deep benthic communities in the Gulf of Mexico that have been damaged by the Deepwater Horizon disaster. A major focus of this effort is understanding shelf edge coral habitats in the Gulf which are actually quite similar to those mentioned earlier in the South Atlantic region. Those researchers in the Gulf are using samples from the South Atlantic for the restoration work, as well as for laboratory reproduction and propagation studies. So what we'll be learning from that $126 million spent in the Gulf over the next few years is a great opportunity to provide additional information for the South Atlantic Council. So I think a take home message of this talk is that research during the last initiative identified valuable and vulnerable deep sea habitats that aren't currently protected, as well as reinforcing uh, the great work of the South Atlantic Council in protecting a lot of areas that really do need it. These new mapping, survey, and model results can be used to refine coral habitat areas of particular concern 
and marine protected area boundaries if the council wishes to do so. Several mechanisms exist under the Magnuson-Stevens Act to protect these ecosystems, and not all of them have been used in the South Atlantic. If the council is interested in exploring other habitat protection options, we're happy to help. Also, our modeling colleagues at NCOS will be happy to talk with the SSC anytime. So again, I'd like to acknowledge the council for proactively protecting important seafloor areas and significantly expanding them as new research has discovered more and more deep sea coral and sponge habitat outside existing boundaries. So unless there are any burning questions for me, I'm happy to delay discussion until after Sam's presentation, wherever works best. Yeah, I think it would work best just to go right to Sam and then we'll have all the questions at the end if you would still be available, Heather. Absolutely, sounds good. All right, thank you. All right, Sam, you should be getting notification for to become presenter. Yes, let us see. All right, I'm seeing your presentation and we can hear you well. Perfect, easy enough. All right, so thank you, Heather, for that awesome presentation. I actually had never heard that opening quote before and I, I really like it and I think it it really highlights how important these partnerships are in order to really get the most out of our exploration opportunities. Um, it's a huge effort on everybody's part to get out there and, and continue to explore the deep ocean as well as um, have some actionable items afterwards and then push forward with it. So having all these partnerships is, um, it's very fruitful and it kind of, that sense of community, I think is, is great and always keeps me coming back for more. Um, so today I wanna to talk to everybody kind of about um, what we've done over the past couple of years, exploring the Blake Plateau and build a little further on some of the, the topics that um, Heather had opened up um, in her presentation and just dig a little bit deeper into, or I guess I should say dive deeper, um, into some of the, the work that we've done in this region over the past four years. So who are we? Uh, NOAA Ocean Exploration, uh, we're tasked with leading the national effort to explore the deep ocean. So we're the only federally funded program that's based on exploration. Um, and we have a couple of different tools that we use to accomplish this task. The primary one that we, we have is the NOAA Ship Oceanus Explorer. On board the Oceanus Explorer, we have um, an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, the Deep Discoverer. And that's what, if you've ever seen any of our live feeds or any of the videos generated, I'll be showing some shortly. Um, this is what's creating those, that excellent imagery and also collecting samples and getting some of that um, further exploration work. Um, we also have a suite of sonars on board for multi-beam mapping as well as water column mapping and some sub-bottom profiling as well. So we kind of get a complete picture of from the water column down to the seafloor and uh, up to about 80 meters beneath. Um, so we can characterize these regions as we move through them. So, I'm going to start with a video about the Blake Plateau. Unfortunately, the audio won't work in this for us, um, which is fine. But I'll uh, talk through it as it's going. I'm just trying to mute the audio on my side so it doesn't trip me up as I'm speaking. So the Blake Plateau is a relatively flat and relatively shallow region off of the Southeast. Um, I was actually surprised that I had never heard of it, having spent most of my adult life in North Carolina and being in the marine science field. Um, but it's become an area of increasing interest to scientists, both in, uh, in the coral fields, as well as um, other habitat modeling. Um, and just a little bit of background on the Blake Plateau. It's between roughly 600 and 1,000 meters, nice flat shelf, and then it comes out to this escarpment, which is a steep drop off into the abyss. 
There's been some foundational work done there um, starting in the early 2000s where there are a bunch of dives and submersibles and really starting to, to figure out that this area may not be as flat and featureless and uh, soft sediment as we initially thought. Um, over the past decade or so, we've done a number of expeditions here and I'll go a little bit more into some of the specifics as we're going uh, through this presentation about why this has become so interesting and, and why, we, why we care. This is also a region that's um, a good example of the NOMEC strategy, which Heather uh, spoke about a little bit earlier, and how we work with different partners to um, build out coverage, both multi-beam and, and some of our exploration work. And so each expedition builds upon the previous one so we can get more of a complete picture um, both of what the seafloor looks like and the habitats that are generated there and doing some ROV dives and HOV dives in order to ground truth the data that we're seeing and, and to be able to really get more of a complete picture. And, and later on in this presentation, I'll talk about some of the work that's been done in order to uh, characterize this area. Um, but as you can see, very dense corals a lot of Lophelia mounds here, which we'll, we'll continue to see. So I'm just gonna let this play out for the next minute or so, so we can see some more of the, the imagery that we've collected in this region over the past decade. And if you're interested, uh, all these videos are hosted on YouTube. I actually just tested it right now um, to see if you could just type in Blake Plateau, no ocean exploration, and it comes right up. And then you can hear um, the audio associated with this or, or go back and, and check it out at some other time. All right. So some of the accomplishments uh, for our Aspire campaign, we mapped uh, just under 120,000 square kilometers on the Blake Plateau, um, and that pretty much closed it out for the most part. So we focus in our program on waters deeper than 200 meters, um, and most of the areas out there we've uh, we've filled in, which was a, a large effort, and it will allow us to have a more complete picture and, and to better inform decisions moving forward. Uh, we mapped several hundred new deep sea coral mounds, and this is something that was really exciting because um, we really didn't know what we were gonna see in there. We had some hints that it wasn't as flat and featureless as we initially had thought, um, but the, I think the extent of it was, was pretty astounding and very exciting. Um, Throughout our campaign, we conducted 24 ROV and HOV dives in the HAP Sea, um, and we saw corals and sponges in all of them. A lot of very high density, very high diversity coral communities. Uh, some of the scientists we had on board said they'd never seen such density before um, and had to pick their mouths up off the floor as we're going through. I was, I was one of them. Um, and some of the dives mapping and the subsequent analysis that we've done in this region have identified it as the largest continuous cold water coral habitat on earth that we've discovered thus far. Um, and it's right in our backyard. So in order to kind of guide ourselves in throughout this campaign, we initially started with gathering some of the community priorities and this is how we generally go about these large scale campaigns is, is reaching out to the communities who know these areas the best and figuring out where we should go, where, where should we focus our assets and what would give us the, the highest return um, for our investments in these areas. Um, so we were lucky to have the council involved early on to help steer where we should be focusing our exploration as well as the sensi that Heather mentioned earlier. Um, once we had some of those priorities uh, 
input into our into our planning we reached out with a call for input to the greater scientific community and then we're able to really refine the areas that had the most um, the most emphasis throughout these different programs uh, which a lot of them were overlapping which which was great um, that makes it a little easier when we're not getting very disparate um, input. So just to show kind of what we were dealing with before we started this campaign, this shows the bathymetry that we had at the beginning. Um, so you can see there's huge gaps, especially in that Blake Plateau region where um, off of Georgia, Florida, South Carolina. And so that's where we really wanted to focus on getting that baseline information, that bathymetry data. At the conclusion of the campaign, you can see we've filled in the vast majority of this area. And while it was flat, I can <laughs> attest to that after spending months uh, in 2020, 2021 out, out there mapping, um, we did see a lot of interesting things that were a little unexpected that I've alluded to a few times so far throughout this presentation. Um, to collect this data, we had 14 OER cruises, so that's us, that collected mapping data, and then three deep search cruises, which Heather spoke about briefly in her previous presentation, um, that further developed on both some of our mapping data as well as, as some new areas. And then we had two uh, contract surveys that we supported that were done by Fugro uh, to fill in large areas within the Blake Plateau. Uh, and so you can see here that we addressed many of the priorities brought forward by the, the council. Um, so the priority one, three, and four. So if you look over on this left side, hopefully you can see my cursor, where one, three, and four are. Um, those are completely closed out. We've collected all of the data in there. And then we've gotten most of two, five, and six. Um, and the areas that are outstanding are generally the the ones that our platforms weren't really suited for. Um, it's a little too shallow for what we generally do. Um, but we are working with um, some of our partners to continue to close those gaps. Um, so while the Okeanos has moved down to the West Coast, um, we haven't abandoned these priority areas. We're still working to, to close them out um, with some tools that are better suited for our needs. So this area here is that Richardson Reef complex that Heather alluded to, um, which we initially saw in the mapping data, like, ooh, this looks like somewhere that should be pretty interesting. I think we should um, further explore. And it garnered a lot of interest from um, the scientific community, as well as from some major media outlets. Um, it's this huge reef complex um, that is right in our backyard. And on this right side here, you can see um, a model that was generated by one of my colleagues, Derek Sowers, uh, as part of his doctoral work, where he looked at the maximum vertical mound relief and was able to plot that. And he's done this for the majority of the Blake Plateau and is continuing to refine those results uh, with the new data that we've collected since, um, since closing out our campaign. This area is, this is the million mounds as, as we've been calling it. It's a, a little unofficial moniker at the moment, but you can see all of these different coral mounds throughout um, throughout this Million Mounds province. So each one of these we figured was probably some sort of Lophelia mound. Um, and then we were actually able to go down and ground truth and see that that was the case for this. Um, it's this extremely impressive and very biologically um, active and, and rich environment. And some of the significance of this province are it's the it's in this 
nearly continuous cold water coral province encompasses 6.9 million acres, which is, I can't wrap my head around that value. And the core of dense mounds covers 1.2 million acres. And as I mentioned before, this model is being run currently um, to include all of the mapping data. And, but I, I think that these val figures are pretty close to what we'll be seeing with the final values. So it can just give you some sort of idea of, of the magnitude and the scale at which we're, we're looking at for this Million Mounds province. And within the Hapsi and within this area, there's more than just coral um, that's noteworthy. And one of the things that we found, I believe it was fall of 2022, was the Bloody Marsh, which was an oil tanker, a World War II era oil tanker that uh, left from, I believe, Galveston, Texas in the early 1940s and was heading up to New York. Uh, it was an oil tanker laden with oil. Didn't make it. So on its maiden voyage, it was sunk by a U-boat and went down um, off of the coast of South Carolina, I believe, uh, within that Cap Sea. And we were able to kind of dial this area in. Uh, it took us a couple... We had a couple false starts, a couple things that we thought would be the wreck and ended up being either a reef feature or rocks or something else. Um, but when we finally found it, it was based off of oil slicks that we had observed on the surface um, through satellite data. We didn't see any actively leaching oil or leaking oil while we were out there. So I, I don't know how much is still left within the ship we, we found half of it, so the other half is still around somewhere uh, in the area if it hasn't been completely destroyed. Um, but yeah, so this is another thing that was of concern to the, the Coast Guard and to other officials, uh, environmental officials, that it could potentially be a hazardous site. Um, but one of the areas that we thought could be the Bloody Marsh before was this spot, which has since been named Shark Reef um, by us. That's our, our little internal name for it. But we saw, we dove on this feature, I thought it would definitely be the Bloody Marsh. It was the right proportions and found uh, these sharks feeding on a swordfish. And so this was exciting. Everybody thought it was really cool. But the true star of the show comes in a little bit later. So everybody was pretty excited about this. Um, Here it is, a grouper coming into the scene. Still have the sharks feeding. Admittedly, this video is a little bit longer than I had remembered. Um, but this is one that, that got a lot of interest when we saw the grouper with a, a shark hanging out of the front of his mouth. And it just kind of goes to show that you never really know what you're going to see down there um, as we're going. And this is also within the HAP sea. Um, so you find something. Initially, we thought it would be the shipwreck. We were all excited about that. That fell through. Then we found this, uh, this feeding event, which we're like, oh, this is amazing. This is, this is great. And then having the, the grouper come in was just 
definitely the icing on the cake for that one. Okay, so I just wanted to highlight pretty quickly some of the habitats outside of the HAPC that we observed uh, while collecting data in this region. So we did see some coral habitats outside of the HAPC, um, both right next to the boundary. So kind of down here, you can see that I think this is maybe a kilometer, a couple nautical miles maybe. Off of the Hapsi boundary, we were seeing some mounds, um, so kind of in the general vicinity. But also in this central Blake Plateau region, we saw a lot more mounding than we initially had anticipated. Um, so we're running the model again to look at all of the, the Blake Plateau, and then we'll be able to provide that data and show kind of where we're seeing these habitats and allow for um, for further discussion about, about this area. So in the Central Blake Plateau, it's a little bit different than that Million Mountains region that we were seeing before, as some of the coral mounds are a little more spread out and um, they vary in their relief and their, their size and shape. And Another aspect of it is it's a little bit further away from the Gulf Stream. So we're seeing some different things. It's not as Lophelia dominated as some of the other regions, um, but that it's still a very prevalent area. So this video I think is, is pretty amazing. Um, it just kind of shows how, how dense and how, um, how broad this area is. So it's just um, huge mounds of living coral growing at, at, atop these um, these dead skeletons that for the past thousands of years, it's just been this growth cycle. Um, and I love looking at some of these pulled back um, views of these mounds because you can really see just the breadth of this area and it's not only the corals but these corals provide such an incredible habitat for so many different species um, it's pretty much every nook and cranny you're seeing some sort of different organism utilizing this this hard substrate um, so you see sponges all kinds of different invertebrates, uh, fishes in and out. And looking at the bathymetry data, you can pinpoint some of these areas and start to make determinations about what you think you might see in these different depth ranges. Um, as you're looking at different areas up and down the mounds, you're seeing different colonization. So it's just down here, I know sight is limited by how much light you're producing. Um, but as far as the eye can see, it was just coral on coral on coral. Pretty amazing. And let's click on through. Just really wants to keep playing this video. Great. So in the Central Blade Plateau, we saw a, a lot more diversity and a lot more secondary colonialism. So the colonization on top of this, um, Bezophilia and Madripoora was a little bit different than what we had seen in other areas on the Blake Plateau. Um, saw dense coverage of sponges, um, some different octocorals, Spartinians, and, and a, a high abundance of visible cryptofauna. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on with it, but one of the thoughts is that distance from the Gulf Stream um, kind of changes access to food and allows for different species and different types of, of organisms to colonize in these areas. Uh, most of the substrate that we were noticing in these areas were carbonate shelves, as well as the coral skeletons, which we, we've seen. And um, it wasn't that soft sediment that a lot of people just anticipated would be in that, that flat, shallow region. And I believe this is one of the last things I want to talk about is this Blake escarpment, because uh, this was another thing that was a bit of a surprise to us. 
So the Blake escarpment is where it drops from the plateau down into the abyss and into those more um, deep deep sea areas. And so looking at the satellite data, we thought it was more of a gradual drop off um, as, a, as somebody that looks at bathymetry quite often, this does not excite me when you see that. But when we went out there and actually collected the data, we saw that it was much more, um, much more interesting. There is a lot more vertical relief. This image is, a, is vertically exaggerated slightly, but that drop-off is, um, is pretty intense and it provides a different habitat for, um, for so many different organisms in that area, depending on, on the depth range you're looking at and the sheerness of these cliffs and drop-offs. And so you can see just some of the diversity that we were seeing on this Blake escarpment um, throughout these expeditions. And I just wanted to close out with a, a thank you to everybody that's on the line here and especially just the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council for providing such good input um, and working so well with us in ensuring that our priorities are met and that we're, we're really able to make a, a meaningful difference out here, as well as the, the Deep Sea Coral Research and Technology Program is an incredible asset. Um, and a lot of what we do wouldn't be possible without these partnerships. So, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and we hope to continue to work in the future, um, finding some more interesting and exciting things. And yeah, feel free to reach out to me directly with any questions. Um, these are some of the ways that you can get in touch with both me as well as NOAA Ocean Exploration and follow along and, and see what's going on. Um, and I think that's it for me. So we can go ahead and open it up for questions now. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. I will take back control and um, go over once again how to um, ask a question or make a comment. All right. So once again, uh, if you want to ask a question or type a question in, you can type it into the question box right here. Um, and I will read that question aloud for you. If you'd like to raise your hand, click on this icon that looks a little bit like a turkey. Um, if it turns red, that's indicating that your hand is raised and you would like to speak. When we're getting ready to recognize you, I'll unmute you and the, the system will recognize that you've been unmuted. And then you'll need to click on this button to make sure it turns green, indicating that you are ready to speak on your side. So with that, um, if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. Mel Bell, I see your hand is raised. Thanks, you got me too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, yeah. I just wanted to thank you guys. That that's amazing, uh, outstanding presentation, both of you, and just a, amazing, uh, an amazing place. I would agree, Heather. But why bother with Mars? Honestly, it just and it is right in our backyard. So thank you so much for all you guys have done out there and, and documenting this. And uh, I, I would also say that um, you mentioned. Uh, I guess maybe some additional uh, emphasis on documentation of, uh, of the fish species that are associated with these uh, essential habitats. So I certainly applaud that effort and uh, never apologize for showing a bunch of fish people a uh, uh, really cool uh, video of fish doing their thing down there. The uh, direct fish is fascinating. So just keep it, I mean, it's great. Thank you so much for uh, presenting all of this. All right, and then there was a question that has come in online. Um, Heather, this might be for you. Are there other countries performing deep sea coral research and mapping? Yeah, I, I can talk about that, but I just first wanted to acknowledge the comment just before and thank you for the thank you. It makes our day when we hear about um, council staff watching the, um, the live feed 
going on while they're in the office back in the days before when we used to be in the office um, or anybody really in council members anybody watching and, and keeping track of it all so we love to be here and, and to talk about it okay deep sea coral research in other countries <clears throat> yeah um coming up in four and a half months is the international deep sea coral symposium the eighth one we've ever had it is in edinburgh scotland <laughs> so there are a lot of researchers <laughs> relatively a lot of researchers in the uk who are studying um, <clears throat> deep sea coral and sponge habitats uh other parts of europe as well i can't name most of the countries except i know in norway there's some deep sea research going on um they're new zealanders uh and to some extent the australians are studying deep sea coral and sponges and um we actually do relative we don't do that much international work in in our program but most of it is with um the new zealanders the canadians and the brits um Tom may have a few other thoughts if we want to ask Tom um, for some more. But, and another U European um, entity doing a lot of deep sea coral work is in the Azores and the University of Portugal. Tom, you're unmuted. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Heather. That was great. Uh, there's been a tremendous amount of interest internationally about protecting deep water coral and sponge habitats, not just within US, not just within individual countries' exclusive economic zones, but also on the high seas. Since 2005, or 2006 rather, uh, UN General Assembly uh, passed some resolutions requiring the regional fishery management organizations, uh, those who are managing the high seas, to identify vulnerable marine ecosystems and deep sea coral and deep sea sponges are sort of the uh, most characteristic of these benthic habitats and to protect those vulnerable marine ecosystems from uh, fishing impacts. So the uh, United States is involved in those international, that international work as well. And Canada, for example, has been a real leader both within its own uh, exclusive economic zone in protecting deep sea corals and sponges, as well as uh, both in the Northwest Atlantic and then in the Northeast Pacific, uh, working internationally. Thank you. Not seeing any hands up or any questions in the question box, so I'm going to go ahead and ask a question. And Sam, this might be for you. Um, you had mentioned in the Bloody Marsh that there was some concern that there might still be some oil leaking from that. Do you know if there was a plan on what to do if they found oil uh, continuing to leak from that vessel? Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I think. And this is this is just me speaking out of what I think it, it comes from no area of expertise. But I imagine that it would uh, depend on how much and kind of like what the source was. So since it is in an area that I'm trying to remember, I, I believe it was somewhere around 700 meters deep. So a recovery would be probably prohibitively expensive and um, difficult. So I wonder if there would be some sort of way that they would look to plug it um, or I, I just don't know. Um, we didn't see any obvious evidence of, of any oil coming up. That doesn't mean that one of the compartments might not fail soon and, and some more would, would further emerge. But um, I don't know anything as to 
what would happen after we provide that information. It's just that we would provide that information. So long-winded way of saying, I don't know. Well, thank you for trying anyways. <laughs> also uh, a question I have for either you or Heather. Um, through the research that have been that's been done over the past 20 years, um, have you guys seen any impacts of climate change in this in these habitats? Specifically in the South Atlantic. Uh, well, we can start with the South Atlantic, but if you don't know, you can expand to other areas. I don't know of any examples of the South Atlantic, um, which is a good thing. Um, we also are not yet at least set up for monitoring. So, so much of the deep sea is unexplored that climate change is one of those things where to be sure that, or at least have a reasonable expectation that that's what's going on, you need some sort of monitoring. And we have thought in the past about potentially setting up some sort of monitoring system, but we're just not there yet. We're still trying to find deep sea coral. There's still so much unexplored. Um, this area of research is nowhere near as or along as shallow coral research. Um, there is some related uh, research that's been done in the Pacific on um, the saturation horizon, so the depth in the ocean at which um, it changes from being saturated enough with calcium carbonate or aragonate or uh, anything with a skeleton that requires those materials to grow happily. Um, so there's been some research that there are corals in areas where you would not expect them based on how saturated the water is with these elements. Um, so that's not really a climate change result, but it's something that is related and was unexpected. Um, so more research is going into that. Um, there are people doing lab studies, but deep sea corals are not easy to grow in a lab. So there's a lot more lab study on shallow corals. Um, but I think, think what I remember on deep sea corals is you're finding kind of the typical thing of it's much harder for them to, to recruit and to grow in conditions that we expect in the future with climate change and ocean acidification and even to persist at, at some point it's even harder for them to persist when the levels of saturation go down and down. Um, I don't know if anybody else has more of an answer. I know there are people on this call that um, much more knowledge of the local South Atlantic research that's going on than I do. If there's anyone that'd like to comment, they can raise their hand. Judd, I see you have your hand raised. Judd, you're still muted. Oh, thanks, Jeff. I was going to ask a different question, so I'll allow anybody to respond. First. Okay. Oh, waiting, I'll just say that climate change is something that we do want to pursue more in the future, understanding what impacts it'll have on deep sea coral. We're just not really there yet. Okay. And we have a, before we get to you, Judd, we have a couple questions in the question box. Um, is there any concern that opening these databases up to the public use may provide honey maps for uh, unscrupulous fishing enterprises? Do you mean where, like the public knowing where deep sea corals are? Um, yes. Well, we aren't allowed to show fishing data um, when, where we have it, and we don't have it in that many instances um, like for, for similar reasons. Um, but it's, it's a balance, right? Everything's a balance. And there are some cases where I have heard we've wanted to hold off on um, showing discoveries for a little while, uh, especially shipwrecks and things like that, which is for a variety of reasons, but one of which could be good fishing habitat. Um, it's not something that we're overwhelmingly worried about. So I guess the, the simple answer is no, usually not. Um, but if there is a case where somebody does want us to hold off on um, sharing data, we would we would work with them. 
personal on that issue. It hasn't come up very much. Um, Tom has a much longer history with this program than I do and maybe knows some examples, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, and, and just to piggyback on that a little bit, um, we do have a procedure for shipwrecks um, and mostly like anthropomorphic things um, in general where we restrict the data until we can have our archaeologists um, look at it and determine um, kind of the importance and the vulnerability of these habitats or these areas. Um, so we do hold back data for a period of time in those cases. Um, but as far as more natural relief where fishermen may be concerned, the way I look at it is we kind of have to, I think the benefit of providing this public data outweighs the potential um, negative actors, if that makes sense, where it would be, it would be really difficult um, to kind of comb through all of the data and be like, well, this could be sensitive, but kind of like Heather was saying, if there is a specific area that we, that garners more protection, um, I think that we would definitely work with them on that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, Sam. All right, thank you for the response. Uh, another question in the question box is, in addition to oil spill pollution, um, do you see evidence of plastic waste or discarded fishing gear in these deep uh, deep sea coral habitats? Everywhere, yes. <laughs> um, it is in, in almost every dive, there is evidence of humanity um, and not in the best ways. Um, one example in one of our recent cruises uh, on the Blake Plateau is we dove in a sinkhole, which was, I think, somewhere around 200, 250 miles offshore uh, off of Florida. And there was a soccer ball in there, just sitting in the middle of it, uh, which was kind of interesting. But then also like paint cans. Um, when we were out by the Azores, there was derelict fishing gear. Uh, that's fairly common, especially in areas where you're seeing a little bit more relief around a, a generally flat area because um, as things drift through, they get snagged. Um, so in every ocean on, on most dives, we are seeing that kind of thing, which is hard to stop, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just add that on this call, we have Laura Anthony of the Council wants to know more about um, pollution, uh, plastic pollution, fishing gear, things like that observed on Okeanos dives. Laura did a project with me a few years ago where she counted um, all the different kinds of debris she could find and uh, in relation to deep sea coral areas and um, has a lot of stats on that. So if the council's interested, she has some, some stats for you. All right, thank you so much. Laura, if you wanted to give a comment, you're more than welcome to. Hi, um, thanks for the shout out, Heather. Um, I'll just mention that I'm actually working on a manuscript right now that will be hopefully published um, within the next few months um, about all of the debris that debris data that I collected from the NOAA Okeanos video. Thank you. All right, uh, just a follow up. Um, are those items able to be cleaned up at that depth? Uh, how much money do you have? Yeah, that was what I was gonna say. <laughs> I uh, can do anything with, well, with the enough resources, but you know, what do you, there's so many questions that go into that. Are you disturbing a habitat? Like if it's something big that uh, animals are growing on, then there are a lot of questions of whether you actually want to remove it or not. Um, if it's small things, the deep sea is such an enormous place. You would need so much money to do anything about it. And what's the benefit? It depends on you know, what's there and so many questions that go along with that one. It's not something that our program has addressed. Yeah, and and as far as like 
uh, no ocean exploration is concerned and the Okeanos Explorer in particular, uh, our ROV is not equipped to really pick that stuff up. I think it puts the, the vehicle at more risk than we'd be willing to take, um, unfortunately, because getting back out there and getting back down and, and scooping it up would be a, a very expensive endeavor. Yeah, and I don't want to say that it's not worth pursuing at all, but also the, um, the Nautilus, a, a different ROV last year, or maybe the year before, got entangled in fishing gear and was out of commission for a few days. That's a really big financial hit to take. So, um, yeah, lots of questions there. Thank you. Judd, you had a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, great presentation. I was curious, like, what, have there been, what are the advances in kind of the resolution of like the multi-beam um, capabilities? Like, are you able to distinguish these habitats like from the surface based on the readouts? Or you, you mentioned there's some other indicator, like environmental indicators um, in the water column that might lead you to point to like, this is gonna be a Lophelia area or something. Um, without having to, you know, take the deploy the ROV to get down and actually put put eyes on the particular habitats. Can you detect that from the surface? Uh, yeah. So that's one of the fields that is is of great interest for a lot of reasons. Um, but to answer that question, kind of. Um, so resolution has gotten a lot better, and we're able to collect much better data um, with both of our, both the systems that are whole mounted, um, as well as through other technologies, such as autonomous underwater vehicles that can get much closer to the sea floor and thus get like very, very high resolution. Um, so looking forward, we're probably looking at more of kind of a hybrid approach of going out there using the ship with its relatively high resolution bathymetry um, to map large areas and then be able to target um, certain areas with those um, autonomous systems that can get that higher resolution data. Um, but one of the things that we look at with the bathymetry data as well is you can get something called backscatter from it, which rather than actually measuring the depth, it measures the intensity of the return. So based off of that intensity, how, how hard it bounces back, you can get some information about um, both the rugosity of the seafloor as well as the general composition. And through using that and then ground truthing certain areas, so picking like a representative of, oh, we're seeing a bunch of these mounds, let's dive on a couple of them. And then you can kind of extrapolate out that that's likely what's going on um, throughout the area. So that's one way that we're able to, to kind of do that. Um, we're also working with some other technologies uh, such as environmental DNA or eDNA you might have heard, um, where we're taking water samples and then running it for, um, for DNA to see what species we're seeing out there or at least what um, what a general a generality of, of what kinds of things um so that's another way that we can do it without physically diving on on each spot so i hope that kind of answers the question yeah i can add one more thing too and thank you for mentioning eDNA, sam we have been working on that uh, refining techniques and uh, genetic libraries to understand um who's there either because we're missing it or we just can't see it in the screen or we're just a little bit away from it. Um, and so we can detect some kinds of corals through DNA now in fish. Um, the other thing that can help get a, an idea of what's on the seafloor without actually diving there is modeling. Um, and I'm just looking right now at the report that came out recently that I mentioned during the presentation. It says an initial set of 62 environmental predictor variables representing potential drivers or proxies of drivers were used um, to help predict the spatial distribution of deep sea coral occurrence. So 
beyond mapping, there's a lot of things like slope and currents and things like that that we can use to predict where we think deep sea coral will be before actually diving on those sites. Great, thank you for those responses, very informative. All right, Mel, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, thanks. Just a question, curious, and I know it depends from, it will depend on, you know, exact location, but has there been any, um, some more invasive uh, look at some of the mounds? And I, I'm thinking in terms of geology, you know, your core to see how <clears throat> deep something goes or how old something might be, but how, has anybody ever really looked at how long these mounds have been building? You know, building and building and building on top of whatever the initial, the, the ultimate substrate is under them. I'm just curious, you know, we're talking tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. It just, just curious if, if you kind of know that from anything. I think you're on the right track with hundreds of thousands of years. I'd like to open that question to anybody on the call who know, I know some people here know more about this than I do. I'm not, not seeing yeah. if anybody has a response to that. Um, please raise your hand and we'll we'll unmute you to answer the question. And my understanding is it's hundreds of thousands of years. All right, Steve Ross has raised his hand. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. I was hoping uh, you would join in. What? Just I was you hoping can... you would join in. Uh, <laughs> we're talking at the same time, I think. Um, the only coral mounds that I'm familiar with that have been drilled geologically for aging are um, over on in the eastern Atlantic on the European side. And that particular mound was dated somewhere around uh, over 2 million years old. Um, that's going to vary in different parts of the ocean. None of the mounds have been aged in the western Atlantic that I'm aware of. Uh, it's fairly expensive to drill through the mounds and then age the different layers. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with all of these mounds is that they go through periods of recession and growth depending on uh, where the oceanographic currents and sediment deliveries are as well as where um, sea level is you know and so a hundred thousand years ago sea level was 300 feet uh, shallower because of the ice uh, fields um, it's it's likely that the western atlantic mounds are in the range of several hundred thousand years old, maybe not as old as some of the European mounds, but that's hard to say. That's all. Thanks. Appreciate it. Any other questions or thoughts? Thank you, Heather and Sam, for a, a great presentation today um, and also your thoughtful responses. Um, those can sometimes be a, a little bit challenged to answer all the questions that might be coming out of left field, but I, you guys did a great job today. The last thing I wanted to follow up on was um, also mentioning that you can find a recording of these uh, presentations on our seminar series page. Uh, go under the meetings link on the left side of the, the council webpage under uh, SAFM CE seminar series. And you can see our past, uh, this current one, the same uh, past seminar series and the, the seminars that we've had over the past year. Uh, you can watch a recording of those if you'd like to see them or you felt like you missed something and you wanna go back to it. So thank you all for attending. Um, Please have a good afternoon. Thank you, Chip. And thank you everyone for the great questions. Um, Chip, if you could share the links that I shared with you with the group, that would be awesome. Yeah, I put those in the chat, but maybe they didn't oh, go through. Okay. Um, so right. what I'll do is I'll try to get them on the, the our webpage. Oh no, I see it, you did. Thank you, really appreciate right. it.